surgical decision making. There isn't really time in this talk to cover surgical techniques or approaches, but uh, so this is really uh, uh, thinking about uh, the, the surgical decision. Um, um, so uh, in terms of uh, managing these patients, we've, we've heard already non-operative and then operative, and uh, Claire has protested that some of the patients have no hope of getting better with physiotherapy, uh, and we shouldn't send them to her. But uh, I think we, we still you know, do need to ensure that the patients have had adequate non-operative treatment and assessment before considering surgery. And we did carry out a, a pilot study of physiotherapy versus um, surgical management for recurrent instability uh, as a pilot towards an NIHR grant application, because there isn't actually any evidence to show us that surgery is better for managing these patients than uh, non-operative management. So uh, we do need to be careful that we're not uh, over-treating these um, uh, patients. Uh, when we do get to the stage where we feel surgery is important uh, or appropriate, uh, there are a number of considerations, all that, all that have been touched on really in the, in the earlier uh, stages of this uh, session. Um, and we've talked about age, frequency of dislocations and hypermobility. And we've talked about the assessment and, and measurement of rotational and angular alignment. Um, the things that I'm really going to focus on uh, today are the degree of dysplasia and what to do about that, patella alta, uh, and the presence or absence of degenerative change. And the surgical philosophy really has evolved. Um, uh, you, you have heard a bit about the measurement of the tibial tubercle to trochlear groove uh, offset, the measurement of the tubercle position, uh, but um, our, our management really has evolved from constraining the patella anteriorly over an abnormal trochlea uh, or the patella of an abnormal height to trying to restore normal anatomy. And the tubercle medialization, if it's excessive, introduces more abnormal anatomy, not more normal anatomy. So uh, I really want to try and pull people away from thinking too much about the tubercle position and more thinking about dysplasia, patella height and degenerative change. Uh, and this has all been based on a much better understanding that we've achieved over a number of years of anatomy, uh, the biomechanics and the kinematics that we've heard a little bit about already today. So these major abnormalities uh, are the things that we're going to talk about really in terms of surgical management, trochlear dysplasia, patella alta, uh, and then uh, just thinking about torsional and angular deformity. <coughs> Excuse me, just coming out of the session of COVID. Um, and to inform those surgical choices, uh, we've heard on the radiology, but 3D imaging is mandatory if you're managing these patients. You can't manage them based on plain x-rays. Uh, and there on the right, you can see a CT arthrogram, which gives beautiful pictures and lovely assessment of the shape of the, of the trochlea, uh, et cetera, but it does involve ionizing radiation and an injection. Uh, and so MRI really is uh, the mainstay of our 3D imaging techniques, giving good uh, assessment of the articular cartilage morphology, which is the important thing, not the underlying bony morphology, uh, and the degree of degenerative change. In very rare instances, you might want to carry out an arthroscopy to help in your assessment. That's pretty unusual. <coughs> so these are the uh, surgical options uh, that should be in the toolbox of, of any, anyone managing uh, or thinking of, of uh, being part of the management of patients with patellofemoral instability on a surgical front. Uh, there are a number that I think are specialist procedures and should only be done by people uh, with a regular referral practice for these types of patients. Uh, so starting with the medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, this really now is the workhorse for the management of the majority of patients with recurrent adult patellofemoral instability. So this has replaced the tubercle medialization, um, but it's not a one-stop shop. There is not one operation that can be used to manage patients with instability, but this one will, will cover the majority of the patients that you see. Uh, so it's for patients with very little mild or moderate trochlear dysplasia. It's not for treating patients for, with severe dysplasia in adulthood. Here's a good example of a patient who's appropriate. Uh, so the 
skyline x-ray shows a little bony fragment in that lateral gutter there that you can see. And the MRI axial section shows um, moderate trochlear dysplasia and evidence of a recent patella dislocation. Uh, and on the um, lateral x-ray, uh, no particular evidence of patella alta. <clears throat> now, this is a real take home message for me for uh, all patients, uh, all surgeons treating these patients. Uh, I would really ask you to think about using the supralateral portal in your arthroscopic uh, analysis, uh, particularly when carrying out stabilization procedures. This is a, a, a supralateral portal looking into a left knee from above, and you can see that the patella is sitting very significantly out of position, almost completely dislocated. You can see the rent in the medial structures and the shallow trochlear groove. Uh, and then once you've done your medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, uh, you can see the patella sitting centrally. You can see that you haven't over constrained the joint medially by over tightening the ligament. Uh, and you can see the ligament intact in the extrasynovial space uh, as well. Uh, so that for me is a take home message, uh, if nothing else, is the medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction is the workhorse. And please look through the supralateral portal. And there's good evidence now out in the literature to support the use of medial patellofemoral uh, ligament reconstruction. This was a large series from our unit. And the summary really is about 220 patients, good follow up, no repeat dis uh, dislocations uh, and very significant improvements in the scores uh, and patient satisfaction. Uh, and probably, as you'd expect, worse outcomes in patients with prior surgery, but all the, also in those in female atraumatic recurrent dislocators, although that is the majority of the group. So it's probably fair to say better outcomes in, in smaller groups postoperatively. Uh, this was the indication. Uh, so the majority of patients, two thirds or so, had atraumatic recurrent dislocation. So these are the patients presenting from a young age, very little trauma uh, and high uh, recurrence rates. Uh, about a quarter had recurrent traumatic dislocations, possibly playing sport or those sorts of uh, activities. Some patients with pain and instability, I think you need to be very careful to just treating subluxation and pain with a medial telephone ligament reconstruction. And very few are failed rehab following a single dislocation, being unable to report, return generally to high level sports. And again, this is not an operation for severe dysplasia, but the majority of patients have mild or moderate dysplasia, and very few have no dysplasia at all, uh, which goes along with uh, other series of, of patients undergoing that. Uh, and yeah, even in those patients with hypermobility, the outcome can still be expected to be very good, even using the patient's own autograph tissue. Moving on to the tibial tubercle osteotomy. Uh, uh, now, I've said that we're not really using this for medialization anymore, but increasingly uh, there's a reducing threshold for considering using a tubercle osteotomy to distalize the patella. So we've heard a bit about the measurement of patella height. Uh, and if nothing else, if you look at this MRI scan, you know that that, that, that patella is high. You can measure it, but you look at it and you know it's high. <clears throat> so we don't want to overcorrect the patella into patella infra, and we definitely don't want to over medialize the tibial tubercle. But increasingly, a tubercle distalization uh, is a very powerful option to uh, help to uh, control patella femoral instability, possibly not on its own, but in combination. And so here's a patient with significant patella alta and uh, again mild trochlear dysplasia, ideal candidate for a tibial tubercle distalization. Uh, and my fixation method has uh, evolved over the years from two large fragment screws to three small fragment screws to a one third tubular plate with three screws, which I think is very effective. The pain post operative is reduced, rehab is very much quicker, uh, and the patients uh, are much happier with that type of fixation. Uh, and there's you know, good evidence now in the literature to, to, to suggest the reasons why we would think about distalizing the patella for patella height, both for symptoms of pain and for instability. <clears throat> Moving on uh, to trochloplasty, I think this is um, a specialist procedure and um, should only be done by people who are doing a number of these every year. Um, 
But uh, when using it, uh, in, it, for me, it's for patients with severe dysplasia and recurrent dislocation. It's for patients from the age of skeletal maturity to the late 20s or possibly early 30s. Beyond that time, the bone becomes a little rigid and brittle uh, and the cartilage is almost invariably damaged as well. Uh, so limited degenerative change. Once the cartilage is worn, it's not possible to do uh, certainly the thin flap technique of trochloplasty that I use. And just to remind you, a trochloplasty is a deepening of the centre of the trochlea where there's a central bump, which is a logical procedure. I'm not talking about an elevation of the lateral trochlear facet, which is illogical and increases the forces in the lateral structures. Uh, and there's just a picture of a pre and post-op uh, severe dysplastic trochlea going to a, a trochloplasty. Uh, and again, there's increasing outcome uh, series and gait analysis showing good results from trochloplasty. Uh, I think it's good to see that in our series from Bristol, uh, the outcome scores for trochloplasty pretty much mirror those for medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, which would be considered a much smaller operation. Uh, so I think for these uh, patients with severe abnormality, uh, those are very reassuring results. Uh, and Damien's done in his thesis uh, some uh, mapping work to look uh, at congruity of the joint before uh, and after trochloplasty, showing a return to more normal congruity following a trochloplasty. <clears throat> and finally, patients with degenerative change. Really, uh, once uh, the articular cartilage has worn throughout the joint, your only real option is an arthroplasty. These will clearly be a very young patient group. You do need to consider an onlay prosthesis if you're using a, a replacement uh, because uh, almost all of these patients will have dysplasia of some degree and the inlay may be malaligned. Uh, the soft tissues need to be considered even more so than in your normal patellofemoral replacement population. Uh, and the overall uh, limb alignment, sorry that's misspelt, uh, uh, needs to uh, be such that it's not going to cause the patellofemoral replacement to fail. So here's a case, uh, a young 30-year-old nurse uh, who was disabled by pain and instability, uh, primary breadwinner for the family, and I didn't think really there was any other option than a, than a patella family replacement. <clears throat> and there's, there's, uh, there are many series now looking at patella family replacement and the pros and cons of it, uh, uh, but uh, I think in general the outcome for this patient group is, is very positive. <clears throat> Finally, uh, none of these patients will present just with one isolated abnormality of the joint, uh, and the majority of them will have uh, a variety of abnormalities of varying degrees. Uh, and this introduces the a la carte concept that David Dujour from Lyon is very keen on. Uh, so you need to assess all of the different parameters. And, and in trying to restore normality back to the joint, treat each of those uh, parameters at the same time, rather than just treating the most severe one. So increasingly in, in, in my patients, uh, those having a trochloplasty or a medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, uh, the number of those patients having a, a combined with a tibial tubercle distalization, distalization, not medialization, is going up all the time. And even those patients uh, having patellofemoral replacement for instability uh, might well need a tubercle osteotomy. Uh, and increasingly we're thinking about and looking at uh, rotational and angular corrective osteotomies, but as Damien says, there's really no evidence currently uh, to tell us whether or not that's actually uh, going to improve the, the chances of success of the surgery. Uh, so uh, taking the al algorithm to its, its most basic, uh, with patellofemoral instability in the presence of severe trochlear dysplasia, a trochloplasty plus or minus tubercle osteotomy with distalization, in the presence of minor or moderate dysplasia, the workhorse, the medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction with or without a tubercle osteotomy with distalization, and if there's significant degenerative disease, uh, then a patellofemoral replacement may become your only option. In terms of rehabilitation, uh, I'm very much in favour of early active rehabilitation. I brace patients after a tibial tubercle osteotomy for two weeks, holding the knee straight to allow full weight bearing, but uh, introducing range of motion immediately with the brace off. Uh, and I 
almost never, I can't remember the last time I did, immobilize a limb after surgery. Thanks very much. Thank you.